win the games they should lose, and sometimes they lose the games they should win. But tonight, the Vancouver Canucks pull one out of the fire in the nation's capital. Good evening, everybody. I am Rob Fay, and welcome to tonight's edition of The Nation, brought to you by Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. Well, don't lie. When it was 2-2, you thought, here we go again. But in overtime, it was J.T. Miller. Five hole on Joey Decord, and just like that, Vancouver continues to be as hot as a pistol in the month of March. 12 points since the calendar flipped from one of the worst Februaries in franchise history, and it feels good for Vancouver, who now all of a sudden see themselves in fifth in the North Division with those two points leaping over Calgary. But again, games in hand. We'll get to that with Jeff Patterson in a couple of moments time. But first, I want to get you set up for the show tonight. We will have Travis Green. We'll have some players. Uh, we'll go into the Zoom room. And again, your calls are key to tonight's broadcast, making sure that we get your reaction to the Vancouver Canucks two points, the victory in Ottawa. It looked like another pummeling for Thatcher Demko and net, but boy, he kept him in it. And uh, I'll tell you what, you're going to have to pay that guy and you're going to have to pay that guy soon. We keep talking about the fact that it's Pedersen. We keep talking about the fact that it's Hughes. But man, if you wanted to back up the truck right now on anybody in this organization, Thatcher might be the guy you want to get done. Francesco, Jim, talking to you. All right, let's get to our trivia tonight. Brought to you by our good friends at Logo Pro Sports. Always one of the best and most coveted prize packs in Vancouver sports right now. All those guys, Kurt and his crew over at Logo Pro Sports hoodies, masks, the whole shebang, and we'll deliver that out to our winner tonight. The question that we have for you, as you can see on the screen right behind me, who scored the first goal in Vancouver Canuck history back in 1970? The very first goal. I will give you a hint. It was against the Los Angeles Kings. All you got to do is go on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, wherever you're watching tonight's show. Just put it in the chat log and we will pick a winner from there. And uh, we've had a lot of people that have already received their prizes and been kind enough to put on their merchandise and take a photo, posting it on Facebook and Twitter. And that has everybody else who has it won saying, man, I better get in on this competition because I want some of that nation swag. Question is, will it be for sale? And uh, stay tuned. Still, I feel like I've said that for three or four shows, but something down the road is coming. And I think if you want some of the nation merch, it will be uh, coming soon to a theater near you. All right, a guy that has been on the beat the whole season with the Vancouver Canucks, kind enough to join us once again, our regular contributor here on the nation, Jeff Patterson, who watches this game. And uh, Jeff, the first thing I thought when I looked at the shot-o-meter was, boy, the Canucks are hanging out Thatcher Demko to dry yet again, and he holds the fort. How do you take this game on a couple of different fronts? Offensively, they sure, they get the third goal, they get the two points, but it's another night where Thatcher gets pummeled with the rubber and yet holds his team in. Jeff, good evening, and what did you make of tonight's game? Well, before we break down the game, Rob, let me just ask, are we wearing nation-issued apparel? Like, you and I look like we're matching tonight. I don't have the jacket, but <laughs> shirt here, it kind of looks the same. I think we're on the same team tonight. So I let's... think so. I, uh, I wear I wear this because it keeps my love handles in check. I, you're lucky. You're down a little bit, but I have to uh, leave myself exposed. So, Jeff, take me to the game tonight. What'd you think? Yeah, it's the Thatcher Demko show. I mean, this is becoming a recording. What a story he's become, and the Canucks are starting to make this a little bit interesting now. And I, I always couch it with, I, I still think the hole is going to be deep, but man. If they can get another one on Wednesday, they march into Montreal, and all of a sudden those games, Friday and Saturday against the Habs, uh, you know, they're going to be a little meat on that bone. So let's see where it goes. i got to take care of business first, and uh, I would caution the Canucks that they're going to have to be a whole lot better on Wednesday in the rematch against the Senators than they were here tonight. Thatcher Demko gets all the, applaud, the, applaud, <laughs> the applause uh, for another performance. Look, the Senators set a season high for shots on goal back in Vancouver in that three-game run when they were terrible and they got outscored 16-3. to uh, They upped the, the ante here tonight. They established a new season high. So the two highest shot totals for the Ottawa Senators this season have both come against the Vancouver Canucks. Now, it's about getting victories, and even though this one needed overtime, the single point the Sens get, that doesn't matter to the Canucks. The Canucks got the job done. They found a way as they try to creep closer two teams in front of them like the Montreal Canadiens. But, look, this looked and felt an awful lot like last summer against Vegas. 
But the Vegas Golden Knights are designed to win the Stanley Cup, Rob. These are the Ottawa Senators who have yes. been residing yeah. in the basement all <laughs> season long. And they took the Canucks to school on the shot clock. 46 shots on the night. Thatcher Demko gives up two, but he wouldn't give up the next one. And JT Miller, who obviously has had uh, an up-and-down season, he comes through. What a terrible line change by Thomas Shabbat, who plays a ton. Shabbat up over 31 minutes in total in this hockey game. And remember, the Senators played last night as well. So this was back-to-back -back for them. And Thomas Shabbat out there for the first minute and a half of overtime. It's the long change. He gets sucked into the neutral zone and decides to change. JT Miller off the bench with the fresh legs right up Main Street, and he wins it for the Vancouver Canucks. So the Canucks aren't getting a lot of offense, just seven goals in their last four, and improbably they've won three of those four. They have won five of six without Elias Pettersson. Like, I did not see that coming. Not my wildest dreams, but when you've got Thatcher Demko dialing the way that he is right now, you get goaltending, you've got a chance every night out, and Thatcher Demko is providing the Canucks an opportunity to win every time he suits up right now. You know, I remember Roberto Luongo saying the more puck that he saw, the more often that he played, the better he got. And, you know, I think you would hear that from a number of goaltenders. They want repetition. They don't want to sit and collect dust. Is that kind of Thatcher's MO as well? Because a lot of people are going to say, OK, well, when do we play Braden Holpe? I know we got to play him. But how do you take Thatcher out of the crease considering he just continues to keep this team in hockey games? Well, this is an interesting road trip because it's four and six. So they've got the two points in the bag. They get tomorrow in Ottawa. Then they play the Senators again on Wednesday. Quick flight to Montreal, Thursday off. And then they go back to back against the Habs. But it doesn't stop there because they're in Montreal on Saturday and at home to Winnipeg on Monday. So not much of a turnaround with a cross-continent flight at the back end of this road trip. You have to think Braden Holpe is going to get one of those games in Montreal. But... Can you take Demko out of the net now if you need wins? I would say uh, rest him up tomorrow, keep him off the ice if you have to, run him back out there on Wednesday, and then take stock of where he is. Because, yeah, he's winning hockey games, but again, way busier than he should be. 46 shots on the night. And so I would say go with him on Wednesday night, take stock of where he is, and then maybe you can play him Friday in Montreal, give him the night off on Saturday, and then he would be uh, fresh and ready to go against the Winnipeg Jets on Monday. Remember, too, that the Canucks play at home next Monday, next Wednesday, and then get a full week off. So Thatcher Demko will have a lot of time to rest and recover when they go a week without games, and that's where all these teams around them are going to catch up in terms of their games in hand. But if you're the Canucks right now, you're taking it game by game. Thatcher Demko is your work. Uh, we'll see if we can get that connection fixed, and uh, we'll bring Jeff back in. Guys in the control room, just let me know when we've reestablished that connection. The one thing that I will say about the schedule for the Vancouver Canucks is they have been absolutely a victim of the games played category when it gets to, I, I guess you would say, for lack of a better phrase, the uh, glass half empty approach. And what I mean by that is we look at this streak, the fact that they've got 12 points in the month of March, and yet at the same time, we still skeptically say, well, the game's at hand, the game's at hand. Within two weeks, I think we're going to know a lot more about this Vancouver Canuck team, where they stand, and what the big picture looks like. So, Jeff, I appreciate your patience while we get that line reestablished for you. Let me take you to, uh, we'll get back to the game in a second, but I want to talk Thatcher long term because there's two things at play for me right here. One, obviously, you got a contract, and every win, every two points, I keep thinking cha-ching for Thatcher, but I also think about what he's been able to do over the last two years with Ian Clark. Those, to me, are becoming very important contracts for this Vancouver Canuck team. I know you mentioned this on the VanCast as well. Talk to me about the urgency this organization might be feeling right now to lock in both Ian Clark and now Thatcher Demko. You're right. I mean, so much has been made, Rob, about Travis Green needing a contract extension, and he does, but so does his staff, and, and perhaps the most valuable member of his staff, with all due respect to Nolan Baumgartner and Newell Brown, the guys that are on the bench with them, but it is the work that Ian Clark continues to do with Canuck goaltenders, and you think of the job he did building up Jacob Markstrom before that, Sergei Bobrovsky and his great years in Columbus, and Ian Clark was there every step of the way, and now you've got 
uh, the prize pupil in Thatcher Demko. And so there's going to be a long line at Jim Benning's door uh, wanting contract extensions. And it's not just players. It is members of the coaching staff. And Ian Clark's a huge part of that. And I do think that, you know, it's hand in glove here, that it's not one or the other. It's one with the other. And so uh, you have to think that the organization gets this. But we've seen that uh, Francesco Aquilini just has uh, refused to open up the taps as far as finances are concerned. And so, uh, you know, there's 24 games to go. I, it's going to become a game of chicken here for a lot of guys with this organization. They get to the end of the season, they're going to have some options. You don't think the phone would be ringing for Ian Clark if he can't get a deal done with the Vancouver Canucks. He would have a job tomorrow if, in fact, that's what he wanted to do. So uh, this is a story that's not going anywhere. It's certainly not going away uh, for the Vancouver Canucks right now. And, yeah, I mean, every time that Thatcher Demko laces him up and performs like he does right now, uh, ultimately he's the one delivering, but he's doing it. Uh, with the able assistance of Ian Clark. So there are so many arms and legs right now in terms of juicy storylines with this Vancouver Canuck Hockey Club. You know, whether they creep back into the playoff mix or not, uh, now we're looking long-term here. And whenever the season ends, uh, that's when things are really going to get interesting. It's going to be a fascinating offseason for the Canucks, regardless how the regular season ends. I also wonder who's going to be calling those shots and pulling the triggers on said deals. <laughs> You're right. I mean, as a journalist like yourself, this has just got to be oozing with opportunity for you to tell some pretty cool stories. Let's go back to Canadian Tire Center, Jeff. I want to talk about the hits in this game. I know it's a category that not a lot of people put merit into, but this was a team that, again, had played last night in the Ottawa Senators, and they came out flying. At one point, they were out hitting Vancouver 29-11 in that category. And you can sit there and say, boy, Ottawa's really taking it to Vancouver. But when I look at Vancouver, they don't usually lead in that category very often. So it makes me wonder what this team is built for. Because to be honest with you, once you get to the postseason, when you get into the final 5-10 games of the season, you need some elbow grease. You're going to need some real moxie to get this one across the finish line. And for me, they're a light team. If you were to assess the Vancouver Canucks right now, forget the goals and the assists, how would you play this team? Would you play heavy on them or would you try to skate with them? Well, I think we saw in the playoff bubble last year, the teams recognize how important a guy like Quinn Hughes is. And so Vegas absolutely smothered him, dumped the puck to his corner every time and forced him to try to move the puck to Chris Tanev, who was def his defense partner at that time. But you saw that it took a toll on Quinn Hughes. And so, you know, I, I think that playbook is out there for teams. Certainly, if you get to a playoff matchup and it's best four out of seven, same opponent night after night after night. But if you're just getting the Canucks here as a one-off or, or twice, they're not a heavy team. I, you know, they've got talent up front, obviously, without Elias Pettersson right now, a lot less skill in their lineup. But they're not a team that is built to punish you. I will say, and not just because he scored tonight, but I actually I've liked Chase Howerluck when he has been in the lineup because he brings some speed. And I think we've just been conditioned with Jay Beagle being an every night player and Antoine Roussel at this stage of his career and having the serious knee injury a couple of years ago. Uh, not a ton of speed when those guys are in the lineup. They're out. And Mark Michaelis, I think, still finding his way in the National Hockey League. But one thing you notice, he's quick. And I think both of those guys have added an element of speed to the Vancouver Canucks. And, and that's something that they don't have enough of. So, uh, you know, when you look at it's a long list of what the Canucks need. They still need more skill. Uh, but I do think that they could use a couple of guys that play, you know, with a little bit of heft. And, and that's one area that, you know, when Tanner Pearson's on his game, he can be a handful down low protecting pucks and, and making plays. And look, he was long overdue. We talked post game the other night. I thought he played well against Edmonton. A little unlucky. I think he had 10 shot attempts. Couldn't find the back of the net. Here, you know, he's the beneficiary of just a brutal giveaway by Colin White. Uh, just throws the puck up the gut. And so Tanner Pearson scores. But don't for a second think that Tanner Pearson has bumped his slump. I had people coming at me on social media saying, there you go, Tanner Pearson. No, Tanner Pearson can't <laughs> score once a month. He can't. He, you know, whether he's trade bait or whether they re-sign him and they keep him, he can't go a month between goals. So, uh, you know, you got to stay on this guy. He's a top six forward on this hockey club. You know, but when we talk about guys that bang and crash, you know, how many years in have we talked about Jake Vertanen with his size? And it's just that doesn't seem to be an element of his game. So, you know, I don't think opponents feel like the Canucks have left a mark on them very often. And I don't think the Ottawa Senators would feel that way tonight, uh, even playing back to back. That uh, the Sens were all over the Canucks in the early going, but the Canucks were able to, to get a few bounces 
Good to see Howerluck take advantage of the rebound there. And then we talked about the Pearson goal. But 2 nothing against a team like Ottawa, you know, it, it should have been a little more comfortable for the Vancouver Canucks. And, you know, I think once they got two and just feeling the way that Thatcher Demko's playing right now, it really does kind of feel like they're taking the foot off the gas. Like they're trying to make two goals stand up. And that's just a difficult, difficult way to play in the National Hockey League on a nightly basis. And it almost came back to bite them. But ultimately, they got the third one in overtime. So they get round one against the Senators in this battle, and that's 4-0 and now against the Ottawa Senators. So they've still got five games to go head-to-head. -head. The Sens are getting closer in these matchups. Those first three in Vancouver early in the season uh, completely one-sided in the Canucks' favor. Uh, but the Senators are chipping away, and so we'll see. But the Canucks have four wins in four games against Ottawa. You can't ask for a whole lot more than that. And they'll try to make it five for five in the rematch here on Wednesday night. And they have never tra uh, trailed at any point this season against Ottawa, which is another kind of cool stat. Uh, a guy that's kind of been in the fan crosshairs every once in a while this season, but I think is starting to play pretty good hockey, is Tyler Myers. And I know that he's been much maligned at certain points in the season or his overall tenure here in Vancouver. But there were some things early on in even tonight's game that I really liked. I feel like he's starting to... Uh, figure out his role on this team, and he's starting to play a little more technical, and, and I think part and parcel works with Thatcher Demko, maybe gives him a little reprieve. But uh, can you talk about where you are assessment-wise on Tyler Myers? Not perfect, but in my opinion, improving. I think Tyler Myers has been pretty much as advertised, Rob, when the Canucks locked on to him ahead of signing him in free agency. Uh, there was a, a loud outcry from the analytics community that this is a player that struggles to defend in the National Hockey League and has probably been given more opportunities than most simply because of his giant size, right? The big guys seem to get more opportunities. they got to prove that they can't play where little guys, shorter guys, have to prove that they can play at the NHL level. And so Tyler Myers has the size. You can't teach that. But there are questions about his reads, his reactions, uh, some of the decisions that he makes away from the puck in his own zone. But for a big guy, he skates beautifully, and he does have offensive talent. And when you think of a guy who had 21 points in 68 games last year, he's up to 14 points in now 32 games. So almost a, a half a point a game guy. Like, you know, at the outset of the season, if you told somebody that Tyler Myers was going to be on a 40-point pace, you'd sign up for that. And that's one of the reasons that the Canucks are among the highest scoring blue lines in the National Hockey League. It's not all Quinn Hughes. In fact, Quinn Hughes' production has... Uh, dipped considerably here, but I think his play in his own zone has improved. So that's kind of been the trade-off for Quinn Hughes that the points haven't been there, but he's not getting scored on as much. And Tyler Myers has sort of consistently been a point producer. So from center in, Tyler Myers is having a pretty decent season, but there are still a lot of nights where you wonder about his play in his own zone. And I think, too, at his size, Rob, you know, his mistakes just seem louder. They feel louder, right? Because he's such a big guy... There's nowhere to hide uh, sometimes with some of the blunders that Tyler Myers makes. So, you know, you have to live with those mistakes. Uh, if you're the Vancouver Canucks, obviously he signed to a big, big ticket. I think it's going to be tough to extract full value out of that. And the other thing to think, keep in mind, too, is these first two years, you know, with his age now on the wrong side of 30, these first couple of years, in theory, should be his best couple of years. Where it goes from here for Tyler Myers, uh, who knows? But... Uh, he, he seems to be a pretty polarizing figure uh, on this Vancouver Canuck hockey club. But there have been some nights, like the other night against Edmonton, one all tie in the third period, steps up and lets the howitzer go, ends up scoring the game-winning goal. So I think people liked Tyler Myers on Saturday night. Here tonight, he had a chance in the second period, moved in from the right side, kind of looked like a carbon copy of the goal that he scored against the Oilers the other night. This time, wasn't able to score. But uh, again, the offensive side of Tyler Myers' game, I think, is all right. But uh, I'm in that camp that still kind of cringes a lot of nights when I look at some of the things that he does in his own zone. And remember, he is a defenseman. So it's uh, protecting his own zone first and foremost before he can get to the offensive end and try to make some things happen there. All right, Jeff, I really appreciate you doing this with us tonight. And uh, we'll get you midweek. But I, like you, are probably looking uh, forward to that full week off for the Vancouver Canucks where everybody's going to play a little catch-up. So, Jeff, thank you for doing this tonight. And uh, we'll catch you on Wednesday. Yeah, and I think, too, Rob, just quickly, that you know, when they get to that week off uh, next Wednesday from the 24th to the 31st, they've got games in you – know, they've played more games than everybody. So all these teams around them with games in hand. By the end of March, we'll have a much better real – picture of where the Canucks stand as far as uh, you know chasing this playoff pack and maybe keeping the the playoff dream alive.
All right, Jeff, <laughs> thank you for that. Appreciate it. And uh, we've got a lot of people wondering where the fireplace is, but we'll save that for Wednesday. Jeff, thanks for doing this. All right, we'll take our break here. When we come back, we're going to go into the uh, green room. we got a Zoom room and a green room. Travis Green and his comments on the other side of the break. We will also get to your calls, so make sure you dial us up. We've got lots of rope to get to. We're going to hear from the players as well back in uh, Ottawa, the nation's capital, and uh, again, a very impressive victory for the Vancouver Canucks. Took them overtime to get there, but they topped the Ottawa Senators 3-2. It was JT Miller with the game winner, and just like that, Vancouver Nation exhales and gets ready for Wednesday. What a thrill. All right, Travis Green and your calls on the other side of the break. I'm Rob Fay. This is The Nation brought to you by Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. When you're responsible for every little detail, here's one thing that you don't have to worry about. Your Chamber's Plan employee benefits. The rates stay manageable and predictable because more than 30,000 Canadian businesses are pooled in the plan. And you never have to compromise on benefits and extra features for you and your staff. Better benefits, stable rates, and a chance to relax. At least for an hour. This is what Canada's number one employee benefits plan looks like. Back inside the Hubcast studios, I am Rob Fay, and welcome back to tonight's edition of The Nation, brought to you as always by Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. And we will get to the out-of-town scoreboard in just a moment. Got to remember, when you're the early bird special, we will end up joining some games in progress. It is brought to you by Savvy Singh and his real estate consulting. Hey, this is a real hot market right now. If you've got a detached home, if you're wondering now that COVID is starting to, to loosen up a little bit, if it's time to start over or maybe start fresh, give my guy Savvy Singh an opportunity. Give him a call and make sure that he is a part of your decision-making process when it comes to your home and your future. Because again, this is a move when you make it that could... Uh, Put a little extra money in your pocket if you do this right. So make sure you do it with the right people. Savvy Singh and his real estate, um, I guess you would say, consulting firm. He does it all, man. Residential, he does commercial, does it all. Again, there's his number right there. Savvy Singh at royallepage.ca. All right, so we've, uh, there it is. <laughs> all right, we got to it. The Habs leading the Jets, that one uh, in midway point of the second period. They're uh, leading 3-1. to one. Those are two teams that Vancouver and our fan base are looking at with a little extra intensity right now because all of a sudden, Vancouver is starting to become a part of that conversation. You can talk about the games at hand all you want, and those other teams are going to get their points, but the fact is Vancouver are winning the games that they need to win. You think of what they were. The fact that they're 5-1 and one without Elias Pettersson, I'm not going to put any merit into that. But the one man that I do have to tip my cap to is Hockey Night in Canada contributor Ron McLean, who said on the fine radio station Sportsnet 650 about two weeks ago, he said, guys, give it about six more games, and Vancouver's going to have figured it out. And I sat there, and I made fun of his red jacket with the brown sleeves, and I said how stupid it looked, but how stupid I look, in the fact that Ron McLean. Outside of Kreskin, and you got to be a little bit older to know what I'm talking about, uh, definitely do it his thing and called it. Called it before he even hit the baseball. The Babe Ruth, the decision so far this season. Okay, we're a couple of minutes away from Travis Green. We're a couple of minutes away from your calls. But the one thing that I wanted to clarify tonight is when you call, I want to get your thoughts on whether or not this team truly, legitimately has an opportunity to make it to the postseason. Two weeks ago, we weren't only not having this conversation. We were getting ready to kick dirt on Jim Benning, on Travis Green, 
on Francesco Aquilini. And yet in the month of March, there is no team in the more, uh, North Division that has accumulated more points than, say it with me everybody, the Vancouver Canucks. So the question that I have for you is, is there a way that this team can turn it around and dare we say get into the postseason? And will it be a case of the lessons learned from the first half of the season when we were all kicking sand in their face out at the beach if uh, they don't take that to heart and play a little bit harder? Got to remember, this team's playing some of their best hockey of the season and doing it with arguably their best player on the team still nursing a wrist injury or at least the alleged wrist injury. I'd love to hear from you tonight. And again, you could also hit me up on Twitter at Rob Fay, which is R O B F is in Frank A I. And uh, again, an opportunity for us to work in there. I've been looking into the uh, comment section, especially on the Facebook Live group. We've also got the uh, YouTube feed up. And a lot of people are talking about the contract of Thatcher Demko and what that number looks like. Is it going to be two and a half million? Could it be as high as three and a half million? I know Rick Dollywall was mentioning that it would be somewhere in that range. Again, all speculative. But my question is term. And if you are truly going to go with a, I guess, two to three year contract, would you not try to squeeze out a little bit more from the Canucks? For example, if you're going to do the big four or five year deal, which I don't think anybody right now with the Vancouver Canucks organization is going to take because you got that new TV money that's a couple of years away. I think there's going to be a lot of two year and three year deals across the National Hockey League, including, of course, what we've gotten ahead of us in Vancouver. So you've got Pedersen, you got Hughes, you got Thatcher Demko, you've got on the horizon somebody like Brock Besser, you've got your head coach, you've got your uh, goaltending coach there, as Jeff Patterson mentioned. So many different variables coming up this offseason. The million-dollar ticket is will it be Jim Benning calling those shots. So in addition to what number you think Thatcher comes in, and again, just looking at a couple of different people, they're saying uh, Curtis Gulliford says five over three. Uh, Graham Byatt says he's going to sign a five-year contract at four and a half million per See, the term is an interesting one for me. The term is an interesting one because, again, in about three years after the flat cap finally gets bumped up and the TV money starts to make a couple of teams in this league flush, you got to think that these players are looking at the long picture right now. These guys are in their low to mid-20s. They've got two contracts still to come. So this might actually, in a weird kind of way, work towards the Vancouver Canucks' advantage in the fact that they're not going to have to hit home run deals with these guys. You might be able to get these guys locked up for a couple of doubles, to use a baseball reference. Meaning you're not going to have to go 8-8. Eight and eight. You're not going to have to go 7-9. and nine. You might be able to go something like 3-6 and six or 3-6.5 and, and, and just bridge it so that you know on the other side you're going to have to hit that home run. But for now, you might be able to squeeze a couple of these guys in. Again, that's just one person's opinion. Who knows what the agents are saying? Who knows what the Canuck organization is saying as well? But as it stands in this conversation right now, the money is something that I'm really looking up. Because again, what are they going to free up? About $21, $22 million dollars? That is going to be distributed between, again, Hughes, Pedersen, Demko, and maybe a curveball in the dirt that none of us are seeing right now. But just looking at what you guys are saying tonight on social media, of course, I've got it just down here on my screen. Uh, a lot of people are saying they can't see anybody externally coming to Vancouver, so they're going to have to sign all their guys from inside. I think we've known that the guys that are coming for sure are the ones that we already have in-house. I don't see any big free agency signings either. But uh, again, what do you think tonight? The last question that I have for you, and I'm not trying to push buttons tonight. I just want to know where you stand on this one. If the Canucks somehow make it into the postseason, I don't care if they get turfed in the first round. I don't care if they make it to the Western Conference final. Hell, I don't care if they win the Stanley Cup. Well, if they win the Stanley Cup, I think I'd answer my own question here. But what would it take at this point to save Jim Benning's job? Because I think we all understand right now that Jim Benning, I don't want to say is in hot water, but might be on borrowed time. For example, the out for Francesco and the rest of the uh, brothers is if they don't make the playoffs, it's been seven years, and you exit stage left. And the reason they haven't maybe let him go already is you don't want to pay for two GMs. That, I think we all know. I don't think there's any argument to be had there. But what would it take to not just have Travis Green stick around, Ian Clark stick around, what would it be like if we could essentially find a way to save Jim Benning his job. What would it take? What would this fan base's opinion be? Because I know there's a lot of people out there that are like, this jam is done. There's nothing less. Yes. <laughs> Anyways, but uh, I don't know. I'm curious to know what you think. On social media right now, uh, cup or bust for Jimbo. That's what Irvin Claveria is saying tonight. They're saying that 
the fact that he signed Myers to five years, the fact that he's got Louis in house, there is nothing that will save Jim Benny. So again, we've definitely got the uh, Benny bros and the bitter bros all chiming in tonight on our social media channels. But uh, I would love to hear from you tonight. So on the other side of the break, we will finally get to that audio uh, from Jim Benny, or pardon me, not Jim Benny. I got him in my mind right now from Travis Green back in Ottawa. A couple of players lined up as well, and we will get to your calls. Appreciate you being patient with us tonight. We're working through some technical glitches, but on the other side, we will get you all up to speed. I'm Rob Fay. This is a nation brought to you by Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. Back in a moment. Your employees work hard, and some of your employees are working two jobs at once. Make double duty a little easier with Chamber's Plan. On top of a full suite of employee benefits, all Chambers Plan health options come with Teladoc telemedicine services. A doctor can meet with you, write a prescription, and send it to your pharmacy of choice. Better benefits, stable rates, and a video call with a doctor who can confirm it's only a rash. This is what Canada's number one employee benefits plan looks like. Back inside the Hubcast Media Studios, I am Rob Fay. Welcome back to the final same segment of The Nation tonight. <laughs> Brought to you, as always, by Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. I've done a lot of talking today, and I appreciate you being patient with me. Uh, it is maybe it's daylight savings time, for all I know. Isn't it weird that now, all of a sudden, it's still bright out, 6.30, 7 o'clock? I know that the uh, powers that be behind us would suggest that it's the wee hours of the night. But for now, we're just going to... Theater of the Imagination. It. Okay, let's go back to the Canadian Tire Center where uh, the Canucks coming off a 3-2 overtime win over the Senators. Boy, tell you what, Thatcher Demko right now, MVP of this team. There's no doubt about it. Brock Besser in the first half, like Jay Pat said, but uh, Thatcher in a league of his own right now. 46 shots that he faced tonight, and he stopped 44 of them, and is a large part. He, he might be the whole reason that they won tonight. So, Let's go back east to the nation's capital. Here is the head coach of the Canucks, Travis Green. What are your thoughts on the game from your group tonight? Well, I'm happy we won the game. Um, I didn't think we skated very well. I didn't think we passed the puck very well. And uh, our goalie gave us a game. You've talked a fair bit this year about having games where you played well and weren't rewarded. Was it nice for once to get rewarded when maybe you didn't have your best performance, as you alluded to? For sure it was. It was, uh, it was nice to win that game, without a doubt. Okay, next up we'll go to Ian McIntyre. Travis, as a body of work, how would you compare what Thatcher is is doing now for you, and it's been a few weeks now, compared to what he did in the playoffs where he came in off the bench and played three games? I don't know. I don't really like to compare the two. He played three games uh, – you know, it might have been the best three games of hockey I've seen out of a goalie in a row. Uh, I think it's unfair for people to expect uh, they keep talking about that time. I think he's just developing into a good young goalie. Uh, and he's playing very, very well right now. What do you need to do as a team when you get up two goals on the road to defend that lead so that you're not giving up 46 shots? Uh, I, I didn't think we played very well tonight, Ian. Um, when we were up to nothing, I, I wasn't sitting there. I don't think our team was sitting there thinking we played well. We looked sluggish tonight. Uh, we had p passes that were bouncing off our stick, passes that we should have made that we don't, that uh, we didn't make. 
I thought we actually, the best part of our game was probably in the third period in the first 10 to 11 minutes of the third. I thought we had a little push there and uh, it wasn't about protecting a league or, or sitting back and holding on to the lead. I mean, we had a two nothing lead in the first, I don't know how many minutes it was, but uh, we just didn't play well enough throughout the whole game. And, but we did find a way to win it. Next up is Farhan Lalji. Travis, what do you attribute the inconsistency to? I mean, we talked about that that Montreal game and then things got much better against Edmonton and then the first two periods tonight uh, against a team that was playing the second of back-to-backs. Uh, just what do you attribute that that inconsistency to? What do I attribute tonight? No, I've lo- I thought we looked sluggish tonight. We didn't pass the puck very well. No, I mean, just the overall inconsistency but from, from game to game. Is it hard to kind of coach around not knowing what team you're going to get sometimes? I think in the in general we've played pretty well for the last 17, 18 games. We've probably had three games that we didn't like. Um, we also had some games that we really liked and, and played played a hell of a game and didn't get the results we wanted. Probably deserved a win. Uh, it's nice to get a win when we probably didn't play our best. Not sure if you were asked this morning about uh, Petey. I know he's not on the trip. Is there a chance he joins you, or will we not see him until you get back? No, won't join us. Okay, next up, we'll go to Ben Kuzma. Travis, your penalty kill is missing uh, three regulars tonight uh, with Beagle out, Roussel out, and Mott out. Uh, what did you think of the collective effort, uh, putting some guys in there who maybe aren't as familiar with the position? And uh, Yeah, it was, uh, it was a big part of the game tonight. I, I think the final number was four to one, um, maybe five. But uh, obviously, in a game like this where um, – yeah. You know, you're not playing well and you're on the wrong side of the special teams numbers. Uh, they did a good job. That was probably a bright spot in our game. All right, there he is, the head coach of the Vancouver Canucks, Travis Green. And, uh, yeah, he talks about Thatcher maybe playing the best three games he's ever played in a Vancouver Canuck uniform, which is saying something considering we know what he did in the bubble last year against Las Vegas. At least that's what I got from it. First goal of the year ended up being a pretty big one in this game. Jace Howerluck took to the podium just moments after the game to talk about uh, his contributions to the score sheet and the plight of the Vancouver Canucks. Hey, Jace, uh, just your thoughts on another win for you guys. Maybe not the way you would have drawn it up with them tying it up late, but I'm sure the two points are appreciated regardless. Yeah, it's huge. Uh, We know we needed these two points big tonight, and... uh... Yeah, obviously it wasn't the way you drew it up, but uh, we came out on top and that's all that matters. How about for you personally to score your first as a Canuck against your former team? You look pretty fired up after that win. Yeah, no, it's nice to see the puck go in. Um, I thought, uh, you know, my line played really well. We generated a lot of chances and, uh, you know, it's, it's, yeah, it definitely feels good to get it against a uh, former team. Next up is Daniel Wagner. Uh, Jason, I have to ask about uh, you got hit from behind in the numbers at, at one point and you seem to come away from that uh, with a bit of a smirk on your face and you saw you stretching on the bench what what happened there in in that instant yeah, I was just trying to get the blue to get it out and uh, you know obviously I kind of turned a, a little bit on the play to chip it out and you got finished track that is what it is that's a fast game but uh, yeah I mean obviously I got up I was fine just uh, a little bit of a tweak but uh, we're good and uh, this may be an odd question, but uh, your last name doesn't exactly lend itself to the usual hockey nicknames with uh, adding E or S or ER on the end. What do what do your teammates call you out on the ice? Uh, Howie. Most people, yeah, just call me Howie. Thank you. Okay, we'll leave it there with Jace Howerluck. Right, there is Jace Howerluck. Uh, you know, it's funny. We usually see the same suspects that come in to the podium, into the Zoom room, if you will. It's nice to see Jace get his moment in the sun and get a couple of questions from the media. Another guy that got on the score sheet tonight, Jeff Patterson, was a little more critical of him. But uh, tonight, Tanner Pearson chips in. At the time, it was Pearson's goal that gave Vancouver a 2-0 lead. By this season, that Vancouver's had a two-goal lead and then given it back to the opposition. But this time, they were able to get the extra point. It took them overtime to do it, but uh, they did get their two points and all is well. Here is Tanner Pearson. Tanner, uh, obviously, we could see the big grin on your face. What did it mean to you to find the back of the net tonight after not having scored in 12 previous? Yeah. Um, I knew it was coming. Uh, I was going to have my chances. Just had to you know, keep on 
keep on going and not uh, not worry about the outcome and just uh, keep shooting the puck. And for you guys as a group to get another two points, maybe, you know, not an oil painting tonight, but you get it done anyway. Yeah, I think, you know, we had a few games there where we played pretty good hockey and didn't come out on the right end. And, um, you know, tonight we maybe didn't play our best, but um, came out on the right end. So, um, you know, you take them when you can get them for sure. Next is Ian McIntyre. Hey, Tanner, what do you guys uh, need to do better when you get into a situation you're leading on the road to nothing? Uh, how do you need to play so you're not giving up 46 shots? Yeah, I think just predictable. Um, you know, our game is putting pucks in and, and four check and creating turnovers and going from there. Um, you know, if we not strong in the lines and, and whatnot, it, uh, you know, we can kind of create our own bad bounces, I guess. And, um, you know, credit to them. They were throwing everything on net, and Denver, uh, Denver played great again. Is it is it unreasonable to ask Demko to do what he's had to do in a couple of these games with the volume of shots and scoring chances he's faced? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we for sure need to help him out more. Um, usually most stuff that we give up comes from from ourselves. Um, so if we clean that stuff up, we'll, we'll help him out uh, just by doing that. There he is, Tanner Pearson, back at the Canadian Tire Centre with the Vancouver Canucks win tonight. It took him overtime, but they did get past the Ottawa Senators 3-2. to two. And I know Tanner Pearson's probably felt it over the last couple of weeks that he is, in fact, a potential chip that maybe a couple of teams are inquiring about. But at the same time, it's nice for him just to be able to contribute tonight to a Vancouver Canucks victory. Story is Thatcher Demko. I could have said that to you in the first minute. I've waited till the 41st to say it to you this, this evening. But uh, what a story. And you think of this Vancouver Canuck re-emergence into the North Division. It's, it's one guy. Like, it really is. Name another guy that is even on the wavelength right now that Thatcher's in. The fact that he's locked in right now. Would it be fair to say that Thatcher has probably increased his value in potential extension talks by as much as a million dollars? Like, let's say Thatcher Demko was going to go into his next contract and look at something like three and three. Is it now three at four and a half million? Like, has he gotten to that level just because he is now a bona fide number one? He is a bona fide future guy. He's a piece. He's a part of the core now. We weren't sure because last year we obviously had options. But with Jacob Markstrom gone and Thatcher clearly the guy, I got to think he has increased his value by at least a million dollars in, in conversations with Jim Benning and Francesco. But that's just me. Okay. Full disclosure, we've had some technical difficulties tonight. We had some with Jay Pat at the end of my interview with him. Uh, we aren't going to be able to go into our Zoom room tonight. I really apologize because that's the bread and butter of this show is being able to communicate with you. But I wanted to make sure that you got all the stuff, the press conferences back at the Canadian Tire Center, and we were at least able to talk Canucks tonight. So it's going to be a bit of an abbreviated show. Guys in the back have been working like firecrackers trying to figure out what the problem was. But tonight... We were just uh, a little short on that front, so uh, on Wednesday we'll be better. Tonight, let's get you to our trivia winner. It's brought to you by our good friends at Logo Pro Sports. And I wanted to say, this one, on a scale of th one to five, probably about a three, who is the first Vancouver Canuck in franchise history to score a goal? A name that maybe doesn't uh, resonate with everybody, but as we flip the page here, yeah, back in 1970, it was Barry Wilkins. No relation to Dominique. He scored the uh, first ever goal in a 3-1 loss to the Los Angeles. I don't know, man. The Dominique thing's all I had for you. Our winner tonight, who's receiving a prize pack courtesy of Logo Pro Sports, is Irvin Claveria. Welcome to the club. Irvin was the one that uh, probably got on Google the fastest. Come on, man. Nobody knows that off the top of their head. But in this day and age, it takes you about 15 seconds to figure out who it was. And congratulations, Irvin. You will have a prize back from Logo Pro Sports coming your way in just a matter of moments. And I also wanted to say to Valerie and her staff at dogpartners.ca, uh, you guys have been such a great partner to us from the start, and I just wanted to let you know tonight that we were uh, very appreciative that you were supportive of Jeff Patterson and his appearance on this show. Um, I will tell you this, as an owner of a young dog that is a little timid at times, 
These are the kind of people that can change the course of not just that dog's life, but a family's life. We always get nervous when I walk my little guy outside because we're not sure if he's going to bark and lunge at a dog or if he's going to be timid and really be scared in that moment. But uh, I've started to research and research more the importance of having training when it comes to your pet. And Valerie and her staff at dogpartners.ca at the top of their game. Not just because they're sponsors of the show, but because of what they've been doing for more than 20 years. So please, if you got a dog and there's any kinds of adjustments or you just want to build up that confidence in your young pup or maybe even one of your older dogs, dogpartners.ca can help bridge that gap and make that an experience that will last a lifetime. Okay, we've gotten through the trivia. We've got the upcoming games. I think that's about where we're at right now. Let's get you to those upcoming games. Vancouver Canucks obviously have one more game coming up uh, as I move off to the side here. Gosh, I still love those logos. Savvy Singh family, you guys have knocked it out of the park this year. Uh, one more on Wednesday against Le Habitant, and then they will make their way into La Belle Provence to take on uh, Montreal for a couple of games, and that is where we will see, obviously, I shouldn't say obviously, but I would like to think that you're going to see Braden Holtby. You know what's kind of funny? When you talk about Braden Holtby, it's almost like you say, okay, well, I'm going to get the flu at some point. I just want to make sure that I get it as few times as possible. That's the feeling right now, and it has nothing to do with Braden Holtby, who's a serviceable NHL goaltender. But when you've got a guy that is running as hot as Thatcher Demko right now, you don't want to see anybody other than Thatcher Demko. It's unfortunate that Braden... You know what we need here is for Braden Holtby to get one of those games where his new mask, come out, pitch a shutout, or do exactly what Thatcher's been doing and truly make us feel like as we head towards, quote, unquote, that playoff chase or race, whatever you want to call it, that we've got two certified goaltenders that are going to be able to help us get across the finish line. It's possible. Two weeks ago, if you would have said playoffs and Canucks in the same sentence, I would have questioned your sobriety. But the fact that they have just come out guns blazing in the month of March to the point that they have more points in this month than any other team in the North Division, and not just because the game's played, is really a testament to this team's moxie. Five and one with Elias Pettersson not in the lineup as well. I wonder if when he finally comes back, and again, nobody wants to poke fun at the fact that Elias is out for a significant period of time right now, but I wonder what the conversation will be like if this Canadian, or pardon me, Canucks team continues to run hot and then he makes his way back to the lineup. Obviously, you're going to welcome him back. Everybody knows they're going to welcome him back. But you got to think between the boys, there's going to be a little ribbing in the fact that Vancouver's playing some of their best hockey with EP40 on the shelf. I, I don't know. Maybe, maybe i got to know the guy to know if that would sit well with him or not. But boys will be boys, and uh, let's just hope this Vancouver Canuck team keeps doing what they're doing because the conversation's been great. Your subscriptions on YouTube, on Facebook Live, on Twitch, show that you're paying attention to this show, the analysis we have from Jay Pat, from Dave Tomlinson, from everybody. Jay Bowman that's come through here, Quadrelli, Samantha Chang, uh, John Abbott. We have been absolutely loaded with Canuck content and great game analysis, and we will do that for you again on Wednesday. So we've given you the trivia winner. We got you the out-of-town scoreboard. We got you, J-Pat. We got you all the stuff from back in uh, Ottawa, Ontario. I don't know if there's anything left other than to say thank you for watching. Congratulations, Urban. I'll get that stuff out to you this week if I can. But more than anything, my thanks to all the sponsors, everybody from Dog Partners to uh, Logo Pro Sports, Savvy Singh, Move Health and Wellness. You guys are why the lights are on in this place. And especially my thanks to everybody over at the Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. You can hashtag Chambers Plan whenever making reference to this show. To my guys in the back. I know it was a tough one, but we got through it. More than anything, we'll be back on Wednesday. New show, new opportunity to get everybody caught up with the Vancouver Canucks and uh, maybe, just maybe, bring you another broadcast coming off a victory in Canada, Ontario. Until we meet again next time, I'm Rob Fay, and this has been The Nation, brought to you by, as always, Chamber of Commerce Group Insurance Plan. Good night, everybody.